Psalm 111 verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. And in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians, we read that this Lord is none other than the risen Christ Jesus, by whom, quote, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything." End quote. For thousands of years, long before the advent of the telescopes and microscopes, God has revealed himself to us through what he has made in nature, through the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through what he has revealed through the pages of the Bible. As Romans 1 tells us, we can clearly see and understand God's invisible attributes throughout creation. The heavens declare his glory and righteousness, the waters obey his voice, and the ant remains an exhortation to the indolent sluggard. The whole earth is filled with his glory. From the origin of the universe to the origin of biological life, to the gravitational warping of space-time fabric, to the plethora of information stored in every one of ourselves, the universe and life are conclusive evidence of God's handiwork and His glory. So lift your eyes up on high and see who created the stars. Come and marvel anew at the wonders of the heavens. Know that the hairs of your head have all been lovingly numbered. And remember that the one who created the cosmos created you too. On this very special combined two-part episode of Apologetics Profile and Good Heavens, we talk with philosopher of science, author, and the director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute in Seattle, Dr. Stephen C. Meyer. Dr. Meyer is the author of three books, Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, and The Return of the God Hypothesis. Dr. Meyer presents a solid empirical and philosophical case for design in the universe and in biological life. You don't want to miss these episodes. Here on part one, we talk about the origin and fine-tuning of the universe. First of all, thank you for coming on to Apologetics Profile. Wonderful to have you, Steve. And I want to begin with the story that you tell of yourself toward the end of the book of The Return of the God Hypothesis, where you are describing in great detail somewhat of an existential crisis that you had at the age of 14 reading a book that your father gave you about baseball. I, I think that to me, and the reason I want to start there is because as I'm, I've, I've read the trilogy that you've written, Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, and Now God Hypothesis, and what it seems to me, Steve, is that this isn't really a matter of a dearth of evidence. This seems to be more of an existential crisis in naturalism that people don't really want to engage. You know, that, that there seems to be a, a kind of unbelief that is attempting to be justified through science. But in reality, as I'm reading your story about your existential crisis, I'm thinking this is more along the lines of, of an existential crisis in naturalism. The, the way you unpack everything, it doesn't, it doesn't leave the scientists with, with a matter of, oh, there's not enough evidence. It just seems like there's a, a genuine effort to suppress the evidence that science has given us. So if you don't mind starting there, I think that would be a great place for us to launch into the conversation today. I actually have the, the book on my shelf. My father gave it to me after a skiing accident when I was 14. It's about the history of baseball. I was baseball crazy, um, still love the sport. And uh, I came out of surgery um, in a full length leg cast. And I'd been having some odd thoughts uh, before the accident, but they just were suddenly amplified. I kept having this recurring thought. It wasn't a thought I wanted to have. It just kept popping into my head, you know, what, what, what's it going to matter in a hundred years? What does anything matter in a hundred years? And, um, 
uh, the, the sense that there's a, ret- a routine in life that repeats day after day after day, and it, life doesn't seem to be going anywhere. There's an old Charlie Brown cartoon where uh, I think Lucy or Linus or someone's <laughs> skipping a rope, and in the last frame of the cartoon, right. Right. <laughs> stops the ropes on the ground, since it all seems so pointless, you know. And uh, um, so I, I, you know, read the story of the the baseball heroes of of yesteryear, and um, it it was it was a history of baseball told beautifully anecdotally and uh all these great stories and they all had the same trajectory that the the great players would uh show promise as uh 18 19 year olds come up through the minors they get their shot in the the big leagues if they were really good they'd succeed they'd amass records they'd win world series they'd end with a lifetime batting average of over 300 they might hit 500 home runs whatever it was and then they'd retire and then, yeah, they might enjoy the rest of their life because they were sports celebrities, but then they died and they had these, these records to show for their life. And that might, might, some might say, well, yeah, that's because it's sports and nobody really cares. It doesn't really matter. But to me at that point in my life, I thought being a major league baseball player would be about the most exalted thing one could possibly attain. And, and then I got to think, well, what if I was a surgeon? You know, well, okay, maybe I'd save some lives, but then those people would die too, and I'd die, and eventually it, it would, you know, when we die, we rot, and there's no one around really after a certain period of time to remember what we did or accomplished. And I quote um, uh, Bertrand Russell in the last chapter of the book, you know, talking about, you know, all the the, the noonday, uh, the, the glory of our greatest, you know, accomplishments. Uh, we'll, we'll all be, you know, we'll go up in flames at some point and uh, the, the, the edif- edifice of human achievement will, will be lost um, in the heat death of the universe. And he said, any, any philosophy that doesn't take this into account, he says, is delusional. And, you know, I hadn't read Bertrand Russell as a 14 year old, but I had this sense that there was just, um, there was there was a, a, a search in my a sense of a search for meaning that couldn't be satisfied in anything that I was seeing around me uh, and a lasting mm-hmm. meaning that the and and that led me mm-hmm. eventually to um, actually to the family Bible at some point I began to read um, the the Bible and there were things in the Bible that seemed to speak to the existential questions I was having I was also very freaked out about time it seemed that um, moments would Mm. pass and I could remember doing the very same thing the day before. And then, you know, I could drop a a rock or a baseball and I could remember that event taking place a minute or two before, but where did the event go? It was gone now forever. And now I was living in another, another, Mm. another moment that was equally ephemeral. And it, it, uh, so I, I just was having all these kind of crazy, strange thoughts. And I thought at one point, this must be what it means to be insane to be having thoughts like this. And then I became afraid of being insane <laughs> and I got a fear of a fear of a fear. And I didn't like you know, couldn't answer the questions, the existential questions. When I got to college, I learned that, uh, I encountered the work of Jean Paul Sartre and a course on atheistic existentialism. And he, he, uh, um, paraphrased right. another scholar paraphrased his, his idea, but he said that, you know, essentially, uh, without an infinite reference point, nothing finite has any lasting or enduring meaning. And I thought, well, that, that's just obviously true. And then I realized, oh, I'd been asking philosophical questions. I wasn't insane. I was asking philosophical questions. And my, I talked to my professor about this. He said, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's kind of comforting. But uh, it's been said that it's a fine line between insanity and philosophy. So be careful, you know. In any case, I, I found in, in, in Indeed. The, the, this, the scriptural worldview, um, a, a, a way of addressing mm. some of those questions. Um, the, the scripture says that Jesus Christ is mm. the, the, mm. the same today, yesterday, and forever. I, I kept having this recurring thought that there must be something that doesn't change Amen. or that everything that is changing is right. beyond ephemeral. It's, it's, uh, it has no substance because it just comes and it goes. There must be some foundation to reality that is, that is changeless. Um, I don't know that I can offer that as a philosophical right. proof for God's existence, but it, there was something in the scriptural worldview that seemed to speak to <laughs> the, the questions that I was, was having and uh, questions about meaning. And, um, and so um, mm. Mm. I, I ended up 
in, uh, taking a lot of philosophy in college, I ended up becoming persua a persuaded theist as a result of the argument from epistemological necessity, the realization that the reliability of the mind mm. depends upon an, uh, certain assumptions that we make that are used to process our sense data. And those assumptions that we make are either mm. true or false. And if uh, and, and theism provided a good reason to think that they were true. Uh, we, we assume the uniformity of nature. We mm. assume that every event has a cause. We assume certain things about space and time. Uh, the, the Kantian categories of the mind uh, are either, uh, they, they help us process data. And, but the, the categories of the mind can be expressed, expressed as propositions. The question is, are those propositions true? Is it true mm -hmm. that, all, that, that, that uh, yeah. the basic patterns of nature are uniform throughout space and time? I can't prove that empirically. Hume showed that. So anyway, I became convinced that, that um, to believe in knowledge at all really required a, a, a theistic presupposition. So I became a convinced theist for philosophical reasons, mm -hmm. and then later encountered evidential mm. scientific reasons that supported the God hypothesis. And so in the new book, I, mm. um, I is mainly about the evidential case for God, but at the end, I, I, I discussed this epistemological necessity and also the, the, the quest for meaning I had as a young person and the way in which I think uh, the, mm. the possibility of coming into a relationship with a, a personal transcendent and eternally existing God uh, actually addresses those human longings that, uh, as I say in the book, nothing can mean anything to a, mm. to a rock or to an atom or to an energy field or to a particle or to a planet. Mm. Things are only meaningful to persons and meaning mm. is found is conferred by persons therefore, and it's found in relationship between persons. And if at the end of the uh, human experience, mm. we are going to experience a heat death of the universe. And if it, at the end of each of our own lives, we each personally, uh, when we die, we rot as uh, it's often said, um, then the possibility of a lasting or enduring meaning depends on the existence of a, of a personal God who transcends our, our short time on earth and who could um, confer eternal life on us. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't say that the, uh, the, the longing for meaning is an argument for God's existence, but having found many reasons for the existence of God that are independent of those longings, I now think that, um, the, the God mm. hypothesis uh, allows us to, um, uh, uh, to the, as I put it at the very end of the book, that our, our search for meaning need not end in vain, that we might, we, 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 that there may be a personal source mm. for our existence and a person who, um, who can maintain a relationship with us even beyond our short time on earth. Yes, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that story, Steve. I think it, I think it all started with baseball. A lot of I mean, what <laughs> the greatest of all games, <laughs> as yeah, far as great, at least it's yeah, metaphysical. Yeah. That's uh, it. So, that's it. You talk yeah. about so so this. The reason I, I I wanted to start there, because as I'm reading the objections that 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 have come to you from your critics uh, from various different fields, cosmology and biology. Um, that it seems to be. Seems I, have to be I have critics. Teasing. <laughs> 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 uh, there's just a few, just a few, uh, and you handle you handle them so adroitly, and, and, and it's wonderful to, to to watch your calm demeanor. I've learned a lot from watching you over the years and reading your book, and just being cool headed about having the confidence in the, in the, the material that you present. And so that's a, that's an attribute to to the way in which you you write and communicate, and I think that's fantastic. Um, but it, it talks about, I think, the, the existential crises that you experience seems to be, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I don't mean to psychologize secular scientists, but, but by and large, you see a lot of, of this in the popular voice, the, the, this kind of fervent attempt to suppress what seems to be apparent from coming from the empirical side of things there seems to be a, a legitimate or or a very deliberate attempt to sort of suppress the the empirical uh, 
abductions through you, that you make through abductive reasoning, through inference of, of design and and information. And I wanted to read something very quickly. You know who uh, Robert Jastrow was, the late cosmologist and astronomer. Oh, right. and astronomer. wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you're familiar with this, I'm sure. And God and the astronomers, he says there is a strange ring of feeling and emotion in these reactions, the, the, the negative reactions to this idea that there is a God. They come from the heart, whereas you would expect the judgments to come from the brain. Why? I think part of the answer is that scientists, scientists cannot bear the thought of a natural phenomenon which cannot be explained even with limited, unlimited time and money. There is a kind of religion in science. It is the religion of a person who believes there is order and harmony in the universe. Every event can be explained in a rational way as the product of some previous event. Every effect must have its cause. There is no first cause in naturalism. Einstein wrote, the scientist is possessed by the sense of universal causation. And he goes on to call this a kind of quasi-religious faith in the, in, the, in, the, in the secular science, that there is no ultimate first cause, though we are saddled with all of these causes in nature. But there is, when we get to that initial first cause going to Aquinas and all of that, it seems to be some kind of, uh, of, of cessation of, of investigating. I think it's Sean Carroll in 2018, who was describing, trying to describe in his writing, sort of brute facting the universe, uh, like um, um, like Bertrand Russell just saying the universe is is just is it's just there and that's it. And and it was Sean Carroll in 2018 on a on a blog that said uh, you know the the idea of asking why questions about the universe is a piece of metaphysical baggage that we are better off to discard. So in light of the physical empirical evidence, Steve, there seems to be this this nevertheless epistemological philosophical theological sort of emotive reaction to the abductive conclusions that we draw uh, that, that God began all this do you see that in your work well let's go back to the uh, the Jastro quote because I think that's mm. very illuminating um, the, the, uh, the principle of causality is a, is a fundamental principle of reasoning everything that begins to exist mm -hmm. must have a cause okay um, right, right. What Jastrow is alluding to is not that scientists are um, suspending, or, or, or that, that scientists um, are not being asked to suspend the principle of causality. They're being asked to, to consider the possibility that there are causes other than the strictly material. And that if there's a religion in science, it is the mm -hmm. idea that we must explain all events by strictly materialistic uh, processes or events. Um, and yet we live in a universe where there is, in addition to matter and energy, space and time, another entity, and that is mind. Uh, we use our minds all the time. We have direct mm. introspective awareness of the, of the reality of mind. And so it, it isn't a suspension of the principle of causality to say that uh, a mental event might be the cause of something that occurs in the physical world. After all, as you and I speak, we're modulating airwaves and producing sounds. And uh, but the if you trace that that line of causation back to the beginning, it comes to uh, singularities in our minds as we initiate new lines of cause and effect as a result of our own choices. So we know that minds exist. We know that they have causal powers. What science in the 20th century, from the late 19th century, has been reluctant to consider is creative intelligence as a cause or a causal explanation of any event mm. in the history of the universe. And, and that's what those of us in the intelligent design research community are challenging. Uh, in fact, that's the conclusion that, that this is what troubled Thomas Nagel, the great uh, atheistic um, philosopher yes. of science at uh, NYU. He right. wrote a commendatory review of uh, my first book, Signature in the Cell, in uh, the Times Literary Supplement of London, then got himself to, into a bit of hot water with his fellow atheists for having said something nice about an ID proponent. And I thought he would probably be done <laughs> right. with uh, that line of inquiry, but then he doubled down with his own book called Mind and Cosmos, uh, how the uh, right. neo-Darwinian the neo-Darwinian materialist view of reality is almost certainly false was his long subtitle. Didn't, didn't uh, yes. abandon his atheism, <laughs> yes. but he became very, very unsatisfied with the underlying materialism of the Darwinian 
uh, worldview, which which rendered mind a kind of illusion or at best an epiphenomena on top of matter. And he said, we have, mm. minds are part of reality. Right. And if you have a worldview that can't account for the reality of mind, you're missing something really, really important. So I think Jastrow's, uh, mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the dis-ease that he describes among scientists is not necessarily that they're being asked to suspend the principle of causality, which is foundational to science, but rather that they're, that the evidence is pushing them to consider causes that are not strictly material. The cosmological singularity, which, which was what oc was occupying uh, Jastrow's concern, is one of those things that suggests that ma material mm -hmm. causes are insufficient. If matter and energy and space and time themselves come mm -hmm. into existence a finite time ago, before that time, whatever that means, we can't invoke matter as the as the causal explanation because there was no matter to do the causing. After all, it's matter that is coming into existence at that point. That's right. what's so so profoundly uh, disturbing right. to a person of a materialistic worldview upon encountering the evidence for the the beginning mm -hmm. of the universe itself. And that's what was troubling troubling uh, right. the good Dr. Right. Jastro, who wrote that amazing book, God and the Ast Astronomers, in the nineteen eighties. Yes. Fantastic book, a fantastic book. Um, I've heard you say in other interviews, and I know you've mentioned this many times before, but it was uh, Alexander Vilenkin, that was a Russian cosmologist, who contemplated the idea that mathematics obviously comes, we only know of mathematics coming from mind. When we get back to the earliest uh, part of the universe, it looks like, are we, are we saying that the mathematics that, that emerged with space-time, with the space-time singularity, did this emerge from a mind? And it, he, he, I think it was, it, it was Vilenkin, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, yeah, I came um, across this uh, in uh, um, research I was doing in preparation for a debate with uh, Lawrence Krauss, who popularized Vilenkin's work. Krauss's book was titled uh, Universe from mm -hmm. Nothing. And uh, Vilenkin's, right. Vilenkin developed a, a, a model of what's called quantum cosmology uh, that followed an earlier model that was developed by Stephen Hawking. Hawking's model was an attempt to circumvent the problem of the cosmological singularity and provide a kind of materialistic yeah. understanding of the origin of the universe that did not involve a God hypothesis or involve, as he put it, God lighting the blue touch paper that set the universe alight. Um, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Valenkin, uh, un, uh, actually presupposed that there was a singularity, but he he suggested that as all cosm quantum cosmological models do, that there were these kind of pre-existing laws of physics that were present in some way prior to there being matter, space, time, and energy. And that the laws of physics, the laws of quantum mm. gravity explain the origin of the universe. But then Vilenkin raised this very perceptive question, philosophically perspective, or perceptive. He said, on what tablet could these laws have been written on before there was matter, space, time, and energy. And now this is me. After all, the laws of physics mm. describe the interactions of matter and energy within space and time. So if there's no matter, space, time, and energy, right. what are the laws of physics doing at that point? And where do they reside? There must be, as then Vilenkin observed, yeah. they must be purely mathematical. They are purely mathematical. There's no physics that they're describing at that point. And yet math in its pure form is conceptual. Mm. It exists in the realm of the mental. And so then he, he asked the rhetorical question, the great rhetorical question, are we therefore saying that mind predates the universe? Is that the implication of these new quantum cosmological models? Mm. Interestingly, Hawking tumbled to a very right. similar, um, yeah. though probably for him unwelcome insight when he asked the question, what puts fire in the <laughs> equations that gives them a universe to describe? In the book, yeah. what I show is that there's a, I, I develop right. a kind of right. a robust cosmological argument where I say, if, if you accept the, the, the evidence that we have, the multiple pointers we have to a, a true beginning, whether it's the evidence from observational astronomy, uh, the singularity theorems of Hawking, Penrose, Ellis, or the, the proof based on special relativity of Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin that the universe did, as best we can tell, have a beginning. Then you are that you then then mm -hmm. the the ancient Kalam argument has a lot of a lot of force because we can say then whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe did indeed have a cause, as best we can tell. Therefore, there must be a cause that is separate from the universe that transcends the universe 
and uh, mm. has properties, as it happens, that correspond to those that we associate with God. That's one track. But if you say, well, okay, we're not going to accept that we can back extrapolate all the way to a beginning, that there may have been an early quantum cosmological condition where the laws of quantum physics somehow applied and brought the universe into existence, then you have this other problem where you've got math generating matter and energy, and yet math is conceptual. Yeah, so the, right. the, the positing that suggests a pre-existing mind. I show further in the book that all of these quantum cosmological models actually uh, still presuppose a singularity, so they don't really get around the problem of the beginning. Even Hawking's, despite his popular right, uh, right. book where he kind of did right. some little mathematical uh, sleight of hand uh, with his uh, wick rotation thing. Um, yeah. But I also show imaginary numbers. the imaginary yeah. numbers and the claim that, well, in this intermediate step in his calculation, the singularity vanishes because you're in the domain of complex numbers and there's no, no uh, real access for time and therefore there's no beginning. But he also acknowledges that, right. that depicting the space-time geometry of the universe using the complex numbers, imaginary time has no physical meaning at that point. When you convert back into the mm -hmm. real domain, right. the singularity reemerges. So it's a very odd move that he makes in the popular book. He doesn't attempt this in any of his technical work. He makes absolutely nothing of this um, evaporation of the singularity wow. in the imaginary domain, in the complex domain, in his technical work. He only does it in the popular work. And, um, wow. and, but he admits that it has no physical significance. And yet he draws a metaphysical implication from a mathematical description that has no physical significance, namely that there was no creator. So that, that's, that's kind of an odd thing. And he's been right. called on that. Right. But the deeper thing is the claim that the laws of physics themselves somehow explain the origin of the universe without a mind. And yet the laws that are existing in a, where do they exist? Uh, how can you have laws without a physical universe to describe? If they're just if they're just mathematical concepts, yes. then you're talking about a mental realm. Moreover, it turns out that to solve the mathematics that gives you a mathematical expression that includes a description of a universe like ours, it's called the universal wave function. The idea of quantum cosmology is if you get a universal wave function mm -hmm. that includes a, a a universe like ours, then you would have explained the origin of the universe as one of the possibilities that could come out of this this uh, these laws of quantum gravity. But to get that, what's called psi, the universal wave function, you have to solve a prior equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is the analog to the famous Schrodinger equation yes. in ordinary quantum mechanics. And that equation has an infinite number of solutions. It cannot be solved unless there are very restrictive boundary constraints applied to the, the equation. Now, in all use of such, they're called functional differential equations. When we use those equations to describe nature in doing ordinary physics, the physical system provides the information about the boundary constraints. Uh, you might think of a harmonic oscillator. You, you pluck a string. Mm. Uh, the boundaries are determined by how far apart the walls are upon which the string is attached. The right. initial conditions are determined by how hard you pluck the string. But if there's no physical system yet, there's no source of information mm. about the boundary constraints. So where do they come from that allow the physicists to solve the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, to get the universal wave function that includes a universe like ours, that allows them to say they've explained the origin of the universe by reference to quantum mechanical principles? The physicists mm. determine mm. the boundary constraints. They arbitrarily choose them with a, an That's end right. in mind to get a particular universal wave function as a right. solution to this big, hairy equation so that they can claim to have so, mm -hmm. so that they have a, a solution that has a, a possibility within it that matches our, our physics. So it's what's happening is that there's a, a um, the physicists are constraining degrees of mathematical freedom by their own choice, imparting information into this mathematical apparatus, mm -hmm. which is modeling the origin of the universe. And I contend in the book that what they're actually modeling then is the need for intelligent design to generate the cosmological information yeah. that gives them the outcome they need to, to, to model a universe like ours, which is what they right. regard as an explanation. So it's, it, it's very much like these origin of life experiments where the experimenter is constraining degrees of freedom to move the chemistry in a life-friendly direction. But are they simulating an undirected, unguided process of evolution? Or are they simulating the need for a mind to direct the process? If they're using their minds actively to get from A to B, then they, and if they're inputting information as they do, they're actually simulating the need for intelligent design. I think the same thing is going on in cosmology. 
And uh, mm. that's that's one of the 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 new arguments of the book. It's it's the last part because the ultimate atheistic argument is the claim that well we can explain the universe from nothing, um, by but just the laws of physics. Well, laws of physics are mental realms. Getting the laws to produce the solutions you want requires an input of information. That's also coming from the mental realm, from the the, the mind of the the theoretical physicist who's doing the modeling. So I think there's something. Pro- so even the attempt to get around mm-hmm. the, the the standard. Kalam cosmological argument um, that the, the, uh, leads to, it leads inadvertently to a reaffirmation of a God hypothesis. It, re, it requires a pre existing transcendent mind yeah. as a condition of the modeling that's taking place. It, it implies yeah. the activity and, uh, of such know. a mind. Yeah. If, the, if those models are true, they Absolutely. apply the, the, the activity of a pre existing mind. Sorry, this is kind of a long answer, but this is a it's a fascinating kind of thing, a thing that's happening in cosmology where people are essentially trying to explain, you know, why is there something rather than nothing and uh, to do it on the basis of yes. physics alone. Yes. But the physics implies prior mind. That's the key. There's a lot of popular literature, Steve, as you know, out there that 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 goes beyond the technical papers and translates to, to us people here that, that shop at Target and all that stuff. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Neil uh, National Geographic just came out with uh, a book, Cosmic Queries, based on uh, Dr. Tyson's uh, podcast, Star Talk. Um, and in it, um, you know, and this is something that you see, I mean, Paul Davies, when he was on Closer to Truth with Robert Kuhn uh, several years ago, um, had, had, had expressed that the, the, the multiverse was a possibility in terms of getting around the God hypothesis. He said directly to Robert, he said that part of the reason the multiverse was constructed was to finally get rid of God. And uh, I know Sir Arthur Eddington back in the 30s when he when the Big Bang was was cooking, uh, you know, he said it was philosophically repugnant to him. And and of course, as you know, um, the, the father of the Big Bang term, Fred Hoyle, uh, remained somewhat agnostic toward the end of his life, but recognized that there was some kind of design going on. But it still seems to me, Steve, that, that at the popular level, when you go to Barnes & Noble and you get the popular science books on, on astronomy and cosmology, you have somebody like Dr. Tyson telling us that, and this was a quote from the book, uh, the, the Cosmic Queries, um, the multiverse, the multiverse saves the day when it comes to the origin of the universe and, and fine-tuning, because you can postulate uh, an infinite number of multiverses, and if there are an infinite number of multiverses, then obviously one of them is going to yield the constants and quantities that we have, that we see in in our universe. But to me, that's like a, going into a to a to a single house, a mansion, and wondering why the mansion is designed the way it is, and having the real estate agent tell you, well. It's that way because of all the other invisible homes in in the neighborhood. Of course, when you have all these other invisible homes, you're going to obviously get one like this that's visible. But it doesn't seem to have the explanatory scope and power. A multiverse just seems to push the question back um, unavoidably to what designed the multiverse. And and you address that rather rather uh, clearly in your book that this is an insufficient way to to try to explain origins of our universe and the finely tuned parameters that we see. Correct. Well, I'm right. I, what I argue is that that uh, there are very strong reasons to prefer the theistic design hypothesis, the hypothesis of a single transcendent intelligence, to the concept of the multiverse. Um, and there are two main reasons mm. to prefer the theistic design hypothesis. The first is that the theistic design hypothesis is simpler in the sense of Occam's razor. The, the, the guidance of, of Occam's razor has always been do not needlessly multiply explanatory entities. And so if, right. and, and let's go back to first, what is it we're trying to explain? We're trying to explain what the reason the multiverse has become so popular is that it is the go-to atheistic explanation for the origin of the fine tuning of the basic physical parameters that make life possible in the universe. And this has been one of the great discoveries of modern physics. And I devote several chapters to this in the book, the discovery that the, the, mo- the fundamental parameters, the what's called the cosmological constant, the force that's, that's providing the outward push for the expansion of the universe, the fundamental forces of physics, uh, electromagnetism, gravity, the strong and weak nuclear forces, um, the masses of, elect, uh, of the elementary particles and many other basic parameters of physics are finely tuned, which is to say that they, they have precise strengths 
or precise values that fall within very narrow tolerances, outside of which life in the universe would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So against all odds, we have all these parameters that have landed in just the right region to allow for a life-friendly universe. And so many physicists have called it, uh, you know, sometimes describe our universe as the Goldilocks universe, or there's a new book uh, out by the, the physicist yeah. Luke Barnes called the, 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 the fortunate universe. Um, so what explains this fine tuning? Uh, Fred Hoyle, previously a very staunch atheist who discovered some of these fine tuning parameters, uh, later came to a kind of quasi or proto theistic position. And he said that a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry in order to make life possible. Right. And that there are no blind forces we're talking right. about in nature, he went on. So he was persuaded that what he was seeing in the fine tuning was evidence of a fine tuner. The alternate explanation as we've been discussing yeah. is the multiverse. And the idea there is that uh, not only are there a gabillion other universes out there, that's a, a technical mathematical term, gabillion. Um, <laughs> gabillion is but gabillion. <laughs> uh, also be some universe generating mechanisms. And here's why. If you just have other universes out there right. that are causally disconnected to our own, that are causally separate from our own, then what happens in those other universes doesn't affect anything in this universe, including the probabilities associated with whatever, with whatever process fixed the fine-tuning parameters in the first place. So to portray our universe as something like the lucky mm. winner of a great cosmic lottery, which is the whole import of the multiverse hypothesis as an explanation for fine-tuning, the fine tuning or the multiverse proponents right. have to propose some underlying universe generating mechanism, something that would produce these other universes. And they have proposed two uh, mm. one based on string theory and one based on inflationary cosmology. And they've needed yeah. to propose two different multi um, uh, universe generate generating mechanisms because the the uh, mechanism based on inflationary cosmology called the inflaton field explains variations in, would produce different laws and constants of physics, but would not produce different initial conditions of the universe. Whereas the, in string theory, uh, you could explain di the different initial conditions. You would get, you would get new, uh, sorry, inflationary cosmology gives you the same basic laws and constants of physics, but it would give you different initial conditions with, with each cycle. Um, in string theory, it'd be the mm -hmm. opposite. String theory can explain how you would get new laws and constants of physics, but you wouldn't get uh, um, new initial conditions. So to explain the same uh, range of phenomena that the simple postulate of a, of a transcendent intelligence explains, you need to posit all these multiple universes and two separate universe generating mechanisms each of which affirm multiple abstract theoretical postulates, which are inherently unobservable and unverifiable. And I actually have a list of these. There's, mm. there's more, at least 10 of these postulates. You have to believe yeah. in inflaton fields and finely tuned inflaton shutoff energies. You have to believe that the inflationary cosmology will continue indefinitely into the future. Or the inflation, you have to believe in extra dimensions of space beyond the, the, the three that we know. Um, in string theory, you have to believe in strings. It goes on and on and on. Okay. So on the basis of Occam's razor, mm. the single postulate of one God, one transcendent intelligence is far simpler than the postulate of the multiverse. Not only because you're positing all these, this multiplicity of universes, but you have to posit all these abstract theoretical entities that are part of the universe generating mechanisms that, that the string theory, uh, that the, the, mm. the string multiverse advocate proposes. So uh, on Occam's on grounds of Occam's razor, um, the, the, the theistic design hypothesis far simpler, far less convoluted than the, than the multiverse. But it turns out that even in theory for these universe generating uh, mechanisms to, to produce new universes, they themselves have to be precisely finely tuned. In other words, the, the multiverse mm. proposal yep, depends right. on universe generating mechanisms that presuppose prior, unexplained, and quite exquisite fine tuning, a high degree of fine tuning. So the fine tuning has not Absolutely. been explained by the multiverse. It's just been pushed out of view. The prophet Isaiah saw and heard the seraphim crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. 
As Christians and stewards of creation, are we ready to give a defense of God's glory? Apologetics Profile podcasts can certainly help. Our conversational style interviews are designed to encourage and equip you to better understand the worldviews of other religions, cults, and ideas, enabling you to have more confidence in conversations with non-believers, planting seeds and pointing the way to the glory of God. For Apologetics Profile, I'm Dave Mitchell. Thanks for listening.